first of all, that we are explicitly Marxist. And so this is one of the premier places in the Bay Area, if not the world, to come to hear Marxism. But we also have a unique feature that we are non-sectarian or multi-sectarian. Oh. So we have uh, people from diverse groups. Um, we don't necessarily agree on all issues, but we all share a common respect for the work of Karl Marx and uh, an understanding that his work will remain as important for the class struggles of the future as they have been in understanding the class struggles of the past. So we get diverse people from the community, and we're particularly um, fortunate today in having two excellent speakers to speak on Haiti, as you all know. Uh, our thing, they'll talk for about an hour. We will do a fund appeal because we are a grassroots organization relying on the grassroots to support ourselves. And then we will end um, by 12.30, hopefully a couple minutes so leeway there because we have another meeting, a planning meeting. Um, so, um, I wanted to say something else, but... Um, Pardon? Pardon? Yes. Um, this, uh, I will let Gerald introduce each, um, each other. Do we have a time to keep uh, track on time? I can do that. Okay, Raj will do that. So, welcome. And we're really particularly fortunate, I think, in having the two of you here. That. So there are little, little quirks we need to work out. Uh, the use of they will be worked out because we have very intelligent people here. So. Yeah, but I'm that didn't work. Excuse me, all. We're so close, but so far away. Here we go. See, you got to put it here. You got to say presentation, present. Okay. That's what I want to do. I want to. Okay. No. What does it say? New present. No, present. present from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Get on that. Get on with it. Okay. <laughs> we'll introduce Gerald Smith of the Oscar Grant Committee, who will hey. introduce our other speakers. Okay. Right. So what we have here is. Um, and as I set out the announcement, here's the point. Black History Month is unfortunately something that is taken for granted by the careless Babylonians. And some of us are so busy trying to stop the 1% from closing our schools, murdering us, I could go on. Uh, holding our political prisoners unjustly, that we, we forget that somebody years ago fought so that we could have a Black History Month. This is a part of the effort to honor that fight. Black History Month is important. It matters. I will be giving this presentation at uh, three high schools. And, um, and I strongly urge you, our audience, please don't forget about our young people. You know, we need, they need you, they need knowledge. Uh, you're not going to get this lesson, unfortunately, in any public school, and it's unfortunate. Okay, so let's go next one. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh oh. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so it, woo, 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 woo. moving too fast, moving too fast for the kid. Oh, now see, that's, that's, it turned into a slide. All right, I want to just go. Gerald, just click that arrow. Don't click the play button, just click the arrow. Yeah, that one, that one. Just that one. Okay, there we go. Is black history still relevant? Yes, it is. And why? Because black people are still oppressed. And I, I have to say, because I give this presentation in all kinds of quarters, does this require proof? Unfortunately, <laughs> you laugh, it no. does require proof. Right. And just three of the things I bring up is police murders, the continued crisis and the overpopulation in, in our prisons, and the unequal unemployment that we see among black people. So, let's go. Oop. No, no, see, why you, why you want, okay, 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 I got it, I got it now, I think. Okay, so the question then, what is history? A study of past events, particularly related to human affairs, but in order to appreciate history, you have to understand that 
historians have various perspectives. And this is it's true today, and it might be true for some of you. Because I, I remember I bought a book on the French Revolution by this conservative, and my partner looked at the book, and he said, what, what, what you doing with that book in your house? I said, man, what you talking about? Knowledge is knowledge. No, it ain't. No, it ain't. We don't need to hear and, 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 and to further reinforce the ideology of our most bitter enemies in what we read. When we have the time to read something, check out your authors. Think before you read. Okay. So we recommend that you read the accounts of people who actually lived through the struggles and advocated for fundamental change. Okay. So black history, and this is key, makes up, as John Henry Clark taught us, the missing pages of human history. That's what black history is. In fact, black history, women's history, and labor history constitute many of the missing pages of human history. Therefore, without an understanding of black history, women's history, and labor history, it is impossible to get a full understanding of history. So here we go. We're going to talk about the Haitian Revolution today, and people might say, well, why do you pick the Haitian Revolution? Because we know so little about it. And it's a real tragedy. I'm, I'm going to try to make sure, oh, excuse me, that everybody understands, uh, yes, books are necessary. Not only the revolution and what happened, we're going to go over that, but the impact of this revolution. All right. Because it had an impact you wouldn't know today. And, and the children, they like to say, that, well, you erase the, the, the bourgeoisie, erase some. They cannot erase our past if we uphold it, if we pass it on, if we understand the importance of continuity and teaching the new generations things that they weren't even, you know, I, I deal with people now that weren't even born when Mumia Abul Jamal was incarcerated. And you have to you have to grab yourself and say, wait a minute. You better explain the basis. Who were the Panthers? What was Mumia's profession before he was arrested? So that they can better understand the importance of this vital political prisoner. And constantly we have to go through this. Okay, excuse me. I'm struggling, as you see, but we're gonna be okay here today. This is our day. So the Haitian Revolution, let me just give you a taste of why it was so important and the role it played. Number one, I, I, I very often, um, coming from a tradition of uh, civil rights movement, the uh, Black Power movement, uh, the Black Panthers, you know, my little pin and all of that, you know. But you know what? When I say the white man, I do not mean white people. Uh, that often comes out, and what I mean is the system of racism that we live under. So when I say the white man don't want, I'm really talking about the educational system, the head fixing industry, that is the media and the movies. Uh, this Haitian revolution scared the white man to death. Yes, it did. This little part of an island, this revolution shook up the world, the whole world. So let me start by saying revolutionary ideas travel thousands of miles and live for centuries. Working people who are resisting exploitation and oppression reap inspiration from both the living struggles that they see around them and they participate in and also from historic examples. I found inspiration in the Russian Revolution. To this day, I, my little email address is gsmith1917, because that's the date for me. 1917, you know? Inspires me to this day. And this is true of the masses, and the Haitian Revolution is such an event. 
it provided us with not only um, you know the inspiration but also a historic example just as Cuba and China represent liberated territory to many of the oppressed people of this world Haiti in the 19th century was a beacon of hope for it, it not only it, it, it liberated you know some territory but it was the only liberated territory in the entire Western Hemisphere that at that time was dominated by chattel slavery. And, and so I, I, I heard one of you say, well, Joe, you, you're a proletarian revolutionary. Why, why do you keep talking about the slaves? Well, bro, listen, listen here. At that time in human history, there were more slaves than workers in America. The average American shop may have had five to ten employees, maximum. But already, as we saw in Haiti, you had huge plantations with hundreds of slaves. And eventually in the United States, thousands of slaves. Slavery, okay, let me, let's take, take your time. Let's take your time. Say chattel again. The word got lost and when, when you well, said all right. say thank, chattel. Thank you very much. And she's right about that, because we are still slaves. I know, you know, you say, I ain't no slave. Well, you just ain't got no damn sense. You're a wage slave. Yeah. All right? It's a different type of slavery. I'm talking about, in this presentation, chattel slavery, where the human being himself or herself was actual a commodity and was bought and sold on the market. Okay? Now, this book... Capitalism Slavery is something you want to recommend to our young people. Explains by Eric Williams. Explains who was, by the way, the Prime Minister of um, the Prime Minister of yeah, Go Back, Go Back, you're messing up. I didn't tell you to do that. The Prime Minister of Trinidad. Explains the international role of slavery. It's something that we don't seem to understand in our normal discourse. Why is that important? Because we need to understand that capitalism as we know it would never have existed without chattel slavery. Chattel slavery became what's called the primitive accumulation. It provided the primitive accumulation of capital. That's where they got the gap, is how they say it in the ghetto, they gap. The, the primitive accumulation means the monies that went into buying the factories. Example, slavery was so central to early capitalism that it, it, it we talk about mercantilism, they tell you about mercantilism, that trade. Well, what boosted mercantile capitalism was slavery. So if you're going to have a ship, guess what? You gotta make a ship. Where did they make the ships in America? Mostly Rhode Island is where they actually, that was a center of shipbuilding in America. Know that. Well, wait a minute. Now, I'm, I got a little money, but I, I'm ambitious. I want to I wanna make a ship. I want to, I get a crew. I want to go to Africa. I want to, where well, I'm going to get my money. So, uh, Mama, can you, can you loan me a little? Oh, okay, okay, all right. Well, you go to a bank. The bank loans would-be slave owners, monies for ships, for slaves, for land. Capitalism in America was a, I mean, slavery was a capitalist enterprise. And this is what provided all of that, you know, that money that later on was used to build factories and other levels of capitalism, okay? So when Randall Robinson writes his book, The Debt, when people start talking about reparations, don't roll your eyes, my friends. The capitalists do owe us. Because without slavery, there would be, as I said, no capitalism. Okay, so this very important book. I'm going to, oh, excuse me, y'all. Now, this one, is a book that I think the yes we do have to review knowledge because not, we don't all we want to even out our understanding you know this Gerald Horn 
a very prolific author, wrote this book, The, Re the Counter-Revolution of 1776, and it turned my understanding around. I didn't understand, you know, y'all don't know, y'all <laughs> y'all might have been peasants in Europe without the primitive accumulation of capital internationally by slavery, but also the American history and the whole history of the West was very contentious. The colonialists were fighting each other for who was going to rule this area. And it's a very interesting history, actually. For instance, Jamaica flipped between, flipped. I don't like to use the youth's words sometimes because was taken over by Spain and then reconquered by by Britain six times. They were fighting each other, cutting each other's throat. You know how to you know how they think, their philosophy, what they're about. They stab their mother in the back for a dollar. And for riches, they really went crazy. So you had in the United States, Florida was what? That was Spain. Then you had the 13 original colonies, right? But you also had this whole corridor that was called Louisiana that went from the Gulf of Mexico all the way up to Canada, okay? So this was a contentious, who was going to rule this new world? It was not decided. And Haiti wound up playing a key role. I'm going to have to let, let, the, let this in now. Look, Napoleon underestimated. Oh, I'm, no, I, I, I'm telling the end. I, I have to control myself. <laughs> so the point being, this Haitian revolution wound up playing a key role in many ways. I hope that I give it to you more in a chronological order. Okay, get back here. Okay, so who freed the slaves? This is what I tell you. Well, of course, in America, people say, well, Mr. Lincoln's, Mr. Lincoln's, Master Lincoln's freed the slaves. Oh, is that right? And of course, believe it or not, some people think Napoleon freed the slaves because he did, they did sign an agreement to back out of Haiti after they got their ass whooped, all right? I'm sorry, uh, after they lost, they were defeated. Okay, well, actually, I would like to submit to you a novel idea. The slaves freed the slaves. The, in the United States, actually, when the Civil War broke out, the United States was decisively losing the Civil War. Frederick Douglass went to Mr. Lincoln and said, sir, if you want to win this war, I think there's two things you're going to have to do. You're going to have to take black soldiers into your army, and you're going to have to issue an Emancipation Proclamation letting the slaves know that they got some skin in the game. That is, in every area where there's resistance to your government, the slaves are free. And when they did that, this is, a lot of people don't appreciate W.E.B. Du Bois, but in his book, Black Reconstruction, Du Bois, I thought he was crazy for many years until I mellowed out and, and tried to, you know, really understand him. He talks about the general strike that led to the defeat of the South. And, you know, so I'm a little bonehead, you know, want to be Marxist. There wasn't no proletarian general strike, you know. No, there, there wasn't. Actually, though, the slaves were closer to the proletariat than any other class at that time in terms of their function in society. By refusing to work for the slave master, it destroyed the southern economy. And everywhere that the Union Army went, the slaves would say, shit, it's over. Down them tools and run right to the Union Army and join them. This is what he meant by a general strike, and this is what undermined the economy of the South. And remember, the, the, milita the military ability of any society is a coefficient of what? Of its economy. You destroy the economy, you destroy the ability to fight. Okay. Who freed the slaves? The slaves freed the slaves. And in Haiti, that's especially true. Napoleon actually wanted to re-enslave the slaves. But 
when 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 they got to going, now the ugly, you know, mass killings. I'll give you the figures later. If you're a pacifist, just cover your cover your ears. But in fact, the slaves were the driving force of the Haitian Revolution. Okay, I'm, I'm showing you this map because I want you to see the proximity of Haiti. Uh, Haiti came into existence once again, colonialists fighting each other, France fighting Spain, and they made an agreement and, and, and Spain ceded a portion of uh, the island, Hispaniola, Hispaniola. Uh, poor boy thought he was in India somewhere. <laughs> boy, that, I think he missed the mark, did he? I'm talking about Columbus. Columbus sailed, see, you know. And he landed, he was rescued by the Indians, which he quickly, the, the Indians, by the inhabitants of what he called Hispaniola, which he quickly committed genocide against. But understand, eventually, Spain ceded half of that island. And just notice the location, right? <clears throat> Haiti be began, oh, just one more thing about this book. This book demonstrates that, in fact, what really happened in the United States is that the colonies revolted, the American colonies, because they didn't want to give up slavery. That's why they, that, that, that's what they were fighting about. Now some people think that's an oversimplification. I invite you to educate yourself. Okay. Um, by the way, a, a really key work on all of this, and a book that I read when I was 23 years old, it kind of allowed me to become a Marxist, is this book called Black Jacobins by C.L.R. James. This is the history of uh, Toussaint L'Ouverture and the San Domingo Revolution. And the reason it, it, he utilized a, me a method called historical materialism. And after I read that, then I said, yeah, yeah, I, can, I think this makes sense. This is the way, this is the way forward. This is the, the method we need to use to analyze the world around us. Okay. Who's the author again? The author of The Black Jacobins is C.L.R. James. Okay. Thank you. you no problem. Brother. Okay, so let's, let's move it. Before we get to Toussaint, I, I want to first give you a sense of why the Haitian Revolution was so powerful. And why so successful? Because there are definite historical reasons. Okay. Now, as I, I want to state that the Haitian Revolution was not only the, the largest revolt and rebellion, but it was also the only successful slave revolt in human history. This, I think that's of some importance. Let's teach our children. I think that, so when the slaves initiated the rebellion, they started August 21st. Seventeen ninety one, Pierre constantly prods me and explains, no, that was not the first attempt. Well, of course, oppression, you know, repression breeds resistance, of course. There were always attempts. People want to be free, but I want to say that what you had in large part, and he'll talk about prior attempts in his presentation, <laughs> in large part what you had was a lot of, the way a lot of people dealt with it is they just escaped from the plantations and they went up into the mountains. They called these people maroons. There were maroons in the United States. They, are, they don't want to talk about it. I'll tell you something about the, you know, the Underground Railroad, which is good, but there were maroons in the United States that would come from their hiding, go into plantations, free slaves, and bring them back across the border. For years, the Seminole Indians provided 
shelter and comfort for Maroons who uh, breached the border, went into South Carolina, freed slaves, and brought them back into Florida. This happened regularly until finally they were militarily defeated. So Maroons uh, in, this is why you have to look at it as an international phenomenon, Maroons in Brazil, big, I mean, they, these are huge communities, huge communities, you know? But I wanna say that the resistance really started effectively and I'm as, as, a, as a revolution 1791 and I believe that the French Revolution played a role that is why um, CLR James talks about the black Jacobins because while at the time the revolution began Toussaint Louverture was working with the Spanish against the French the enemy of my enemy is my friend yeah, that's right. I'm trying to get free, man. I don't know all that. I don't, you know. Yeah, y'all, y'all the one dogging us, so I'm, I'm, more, I'm gonna work with, you know, with these other cats. The, the, the Spanish saw this revolution unfolding and said, um, "Let's see what, what we can, you know, work out here." But after the publication of the Declaration of the Rights of Man, I know that Toussaint Louverture having read that document, oh, by the way, Toussaint Louverture was a slave himself. He was taught to read, though, as a slave by his master. And eventually he was freed and actually owned slaves himself. That's right, one of the ironies of history. But he grew intellectually to the point that he was opposed to slavery, period. Now there were, as I, as I will explain, there were different gradations of, of, of uh, you know. So what you had, you had the platters, you had the petty blancs, the small whites who did not own slaves. Then you had Creole or mulattoes, free blacks, and then 500,000 slaves a little bit on the condition of the slaves so that you understand. So the French Revolution is the backdrop for all of this, which starts in 1789. So what you have is what would make a slave want to be free? That's almost ridiculous to state, but let's get back there. I ain't tell you, man, I, I'm telling you, boy, Google. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> what would make a slave want to be free? I, well, I'll tell you how they were treated, okay? So let's just talk about basic conditions. S most of the slaves in Haiti were brought directly from Africa. So they had living memory of what it was like to be free. So you gotta imagine that one day you just walking, you know, enjoying life, the next day you being beat because you're not cutting the cane fast enough. This is living memory. Unfortunately, they worked the slaves so hard, approximately 18 hours a day. 18 hours a day that the French government had to issue laws to, because they were dying, the slaves were dying so quickly. 50% of the slaves died within one year. Fifty percent. The average age of death among the slaves in Haiti was 21 years old. They were working them to death. That, I think, was one of the major causes. And of course, the constant beatings. Constant. Slow down, scratch your head, you feel a lash. Well, let's keep it moving. So, you, so you had these different gradations. In, after the French Revolution, they now who was in the, in the lead of the French Revolution when it occurred? There was a group called the Jacobins. Thus, you know, the Jacobins were clearly the most radical faction of the French Revolution. 
Question. This is a question you should know. Was Napoleon a Jacobin? No. No. What do you know the name of his faction? The Girondists. It's a conservative faction. Okay? So here you have this revolution that breaks out in the north. And they are winning. They are winning. And I guess the 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 chemistry between the Maroons and then the fact that many of the slaves had been to Africa had had been warriors before they were brought to Haiti. And all of this is going on. Toussaint decides, nah, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna fight with I'm gonna fight with the French against the Spanish. Eventually, Great Britain, who had already abolished slavery in, in Great Britain, was looking at the situation. And remember, Haiti was the most lucrative colony, including the 13 original colonies. <laughs> 60% of the world's coffee was produced in Haiti. 60%. 40% of the world's sugar was produced in Haiti. They had it going on, all right? So in this situation, Great Britain just, <laughs> right, Wilberforce, remember? Uh, did away with slavery, but they looking at Haiti and they saying, well, well, we can slowly eliminate it, <laughs> but not now. They wanted that, they wanted Haiti, and they sent troops to Haiti to take over, thinking that, you know, in the midst of, the chaos of the revolution, they could make their move. Well, I just want you to know, not only did Toussaint and and uh, and the you know leading the slave army defeat the Spanish. Eventually, they defeated the French and they defeated the British. And we talking about full imperialist armies. These are some bad boys. Oh yeah, I mean, and we. You know, I don't know. I take some pride in that fact that they were able, under those conditions, to defeat those in colonialists and future imperialist armies. So, I guess what I what I now want to um, to transmit to you is the the toll because it was not something that just happened. Wait a minute. Let me see. No, you're going to do that every time. Well, let me just finish up here and say, look, here was the toll. Because it costs something to win. You don't just win. When they, early on, before the fighting ended, 100,000 slaves of the 500,000 that existed were killed. That's what it took to win. 24,000 of the 40,000 white people that were on the island died in the conflict. That's, I mean, you know, they was fighting. This was serious business. Okay. I think that I'm going to finish up with, well, just a little bit more on how it impacted the world. So, Napoleon, who totally underestimated the slaves and the army and their leadership, decided that he wanted to reintroduce slavery. He sent 28,000 troops to Haiti to reintroduce slavery. And I think it's really interesting. I've, I've read several histories. He made, he made me. And, and they talk about, well, you know, they, they got the yellow fever. Yeah, yeah, they got the yellow fever. Everybody get yellow fever. Black people get yellow fever, too. <laughs> you know? But they still, you understand, what they, what they don't want to just say is that this slave army defeated these colonialists up and down the line. And even after they defeated Great Britain, 
that's Napoleon decides, okay, look, we want to reimpose slavery. And and Toussaint Louverture was very sophisticated. He had spies in France checking out what was going on and getting back to him. So he knew that Napoleon wanted to introduce slavery. And just so you know, this is not a subject.